bluish green, greenish blue, purplish blue, blue blue, and so forth. And uh, let's see if I can arrange this so you can sort of see the photograph. Now, obviously, this is a really small piece of paper. So, um, there's, there's, it, it, it forces me to think in major shapes and not get bogged down in details. That's the value, a huge part of the value of, of a thumbnail sketch is the size, the smallness of the sketch forces you to think like an artist, <laughs> frankly, right? To think compositionally instead of thinking, um, like most of us, our default setting, if we're not careful, our default setting is we think similitudinally. <laughs> we think about realism way too much, as a matter of fact. Way more than we should, because the, 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 the winning of the game is not in similitude, at least in the world of more painterly painting. Okay? We've got to move the flag down quite a bit so that it'll fit within the in the framework of this painting. And I'm moving a number of trees around here and there. Let me show you a real quick trick. So I am starting this drawing with a handful of, as I said, blue watercolor pencils. I started with the lightest color blue, and I'm going to set that one aside. The fact that it's lightest means means that I can graduate now to a darker color. Hi, <laughs> Mark. Thanks, man. So I can move to a darker color now, and and I'm switching my grip, by the way. I'm, it's, I'm going away from my sketch grip to my drawing grip. And as soon as I start drawing with this darker color, the lighter color will quote-unquote, disappear. Now, of course, I don't mean that literally. It won't literally. It's not some magic going on. It won't literally disappear. But it will essentially disappear. Our eyes will cease to pay any attention to the lighter blue, although it'll still be on the, on the paper and still affecting the, the final appearance of the painting or drawing. But now that I've start, now that I'm putting a darker purple on, you can see it already, do you see how the, let me get you close there. Do you see how the dark lines, you know what, Heather, did, did my color wheel not show up? I did a 25-minute rant and rave about color wheel, and then I went, oh, no, I'm not sure it record, recorded. If it didn't, I'll have to do it another day. I'm quite dismayed because I, I did a good job. <laughs> <coughs> so is it, is it, you're just getting the title, is that correct? Ah, uh, rats. I'm afraid that, that I might have messed up. So much for working out the bugs in a year, eh? Like I said a little while ago. I am sorry about that. So, um, when I was holding it up, I say, so that you see the light blue pencil marks have lost their importance in contrast with the dark purple marks. And it's a good trick. You caught the end of it. Okay, good. Well, you'll be able to watch it. Um, I hope it's there, Heather. You'll be able to watch the whole thing. Everybody will be able to watch it uh, in reruns, so to speak. I hope it's there because it was really important for some people to hear that. Oh. Every other cornice. I think that's, I'm not sure that's what that's called, but every other arch over the windows here. One is angular and the next is curved, angular curved. All these funny little details that you'd never notice unless you were an architect or unless you were drawing the building. And once again, I want this to be a painting, even, even though I'm starting with the drawing, I want this to be a painterly painting, not a primarily a drawing. But there's, I feel like there's so much detail in this one. I really need to get, need to get some of the structure nailed down before I proceed to the actual drawing. 
Um, it is, not, in fact, not the not the drawing that makes this a beautiful photograph. Let me show it to you again in case you missed it. It's the lighting. Beautiful. Thanks, Mark. Um, and a part of the beauty of this photograph is the light on in one room. And that's exactly, I'm going to imitate that in my, in my painting. Just charming, charming. The light on in one room over the White House there. Okay, I'm going back to my to my sketching grip. I've talked quite a bit over the years about how to hold a pencil. And if you want to be real technical about it, there's um, uh, there's the, the sketching grip, which I'm doing right now, and the drawing grip. And most people need to learn the, the sketch grip, which eliminates the fingers and forces you to think in big shapes because this grip, this grip doesn't do tiny details. This does. <clears throat> Excuse me, get tail tail end of a cold. Every day I wake up thinking, surely my cold's all gone, and every day I wake up and surely it's not. But I'm feeling pretty good. Just a little bit of a cough and a sniffle still left. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I got all these pencils out, and I only used two of them. But uh, if that's all right. Let me start doing some drawing now. And again, the, the, the photograph is almost perfect gray. Which is no fun, of course. <laughs> Just because it's perfect gray doesn't mean I have to uh, follow suit. But I have to decide which way am I going to go with this. And I've just decided right in that second. I'm going to go with a purple. Some purple washes over here. Some aqua colored uh, in the driveway. That's too bright. Let me, let me dark. Let me find some dark stuff here. some very dark green um, whoops my brush picked up some white somewhere um, in the the bushes here so one way to do bushes with snow on them is you don't paint the snow of course you just paint the dark underneath the snow a lot like the art of painting, painting sky holes because you're not painting what's there you're painting what's not there in other words i'm trying to paint the snow by painting what is not snow that's pretty close let it go with that let's change the color slightly for this bush that's a little bit further away yeah again gouache a lot of fun because it's so direct and immediate it's a very fast medium and if you caught, if you didn't catch my first episode today, I said I'm, I was inspired uh, to to come back and do some gouache uh, today because I was watching um, James Gurney, watching his YouTube channel. This is gouache. That's right, Heather. Watching James Gurney do some. Uh, gouache sketches yesterday and it just made put the put the mood put the you know mood in on me to say oh yeah let's do some gouache again so here i am doing some gouache whoops, 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 whoops. come on <laughs> a little piece of tape has to keep on holding on there now let's talk about trees shall we because i've got a whole mess of them <laughs> right here in this scene and uh, if you follow me much you know that one of my pet peeves well I have a list that I put together years ago no four five four five six years ago called the worst mistakes made in landscape painting and the number two mistake the number one mistake is just simply painting cliches in my opinion but the number two mistake is stick e or stick ish trees hmm I'm 
I'm trying to get this fuzzy brush to make a bunch of skinny marks. So one of the solutions to sticky trees is don't, for goodness sake, don't paint one branch at a time. You'll get, you'll tuck her out, you'll peter out at about branch number 150. And think about it, the, the tree you're trying to paint has roughly 150,000 branches in it. And if you do, a, you're off by a hundredfold. So you need to find, that doesn't mean I recommend you do 150,000 branches either. But you have to do something that allows you to give the impression of many branches without you drawing. So this is one, one way to do that. It's only one way, but this is one way, and that is to use a, 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 a uh, I'm looking to see if I have a fan brush, see if that would work any better. Let me try. So I want to use, yeah, that's working. Do you see? So it's making hundred, each stroke makes dozens of little tiny, little tiny strokes. And I'm not talking about brain strokes here. I'm talking about brush strokes. So these are good kind of strokes. <laughs> the good kind of stroke to have, a brush stroke. <laughs> we should make a t-shirt about that, shouldn't we? For artists to wear. <laughs> What's the one kind of stroke you want to have? Brush strokes. <laughs> uh, happy, the, the wording needs work. I know the, the, ter the wording it needs some work, but w w somebody work on it for us, would you? <laughs> The only kind of happy stroke is brush stroke. Yes, yes. There we go. I don't know, something like that. We're getting closer. Okay, I'm going to stop with the skinny stuff. Let's let's now do some blue blue sky and blue snow. Now, here's part of the fun. I think you can see this. Part of the fun of using a watercolor pencil is that when you run a wet brush across it, of course, the watercolor pencil is re-enlivened, re-melted, uh, if you will, and um, you use the color to your advantage. You don't pretend that it's not turning a color. It certainly is. Like we're not, right now, the stuff I'm doing is turning very much purple. I don't pretend that the watercolor pencil isn't... Um, re-wetting. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, there's a word for that. It's silly. I use it all the time, but I'm, I'm trying to paint here. So, <laughs> um, I'm not pretending that it's not, um, reactivating. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm not pretending that it's not reactivating the, the, the color pencil. It certainly is reactivating the color pencil. And I use that to my advantage. I control the reactivation to some degree. Now, not hyper control, you, you see, you play with it. I love uh, some somebody said years ago, I think it was Tom Jones. Uh, I was actually in a studio while he was making a video and he uh, made you may not have heard of Tom Jones. Look him up. Watercolor. And he does stylized watercolor paintings. Really fun. Very popular with a lot of people. Uh, very simple. Uh, and is it's a little bit. Forgive me if I'm being something, but a little bit kind of like Bob Ross watercolor paintings. Uh, but a lot of fun, and everybody should know all the tricks that that Tom jo Jones does with his brush. Everybody should know those tricks, even if you don't use them. Everybody should know those tricks. And he said, "Okay, all that is I'm trying to get. I'm trying to quote him. He said the brush is smarter than you are, or maybe he said the paint is smarter than you are. The reason I can't remember which one of those is he said is because both are true, <laughs> and I've quoted him for so many years since. But I've I've quoted him both ways. I've, I've said." He says, the brush is painted smarter than you are, and so is the paint. So I add the word, so is the paint. So, okay, now, have I, I don't think I have quite enough blue on here yet. Not quite. There's too many white areas still peeking around. Yeah, Heather, thank you so much. I do, too. I love water. It is funny how I use watercolor pencils in so many different ways, isn't it? Use it to do my portraits at weddings. By the way, I'm doing a wedding tomorrow night. Uh, right here in Raleigh, so um, I will broadcast absolutely as much of that as I can. It's always a little bit of a tricky business broadcasting weddings because, you know, I don't know till I get there. I won't know how much freedom I'll have to set up a tripod. I don't want my hosts that are paying me well. I don't want them to feel like I'm focused somewhere else. So, I if I can tomorrow, I will broadcast. Uh, 
my wedding painting tomorrow night. I always enjoy broadcasting those. Of course, I always enjoy um, doing wedding paintings, so it's a win-win. Oh, good. I was hoping I had a smaller flat brush, and I do. Okay, now I'm going to just mix up a darker color that I can do, um, get some dark in these windows, okay? Um, one, whoops, <laughs> two of these windows are supposed to have light on in them, but that's, that's all right. I, I, uh, I'm going to do the light with opaque gouache anyway. So up until now, I'm actually painting quite a bit like a traditional watercolor painter, quite a bit. But um, that's going to end here very shortly because I'm going to come back with a whole bunch of light opaque colors, which, of course, a traditional watercolors does not have that freedom. Poor watercolors. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, no, I need some. I need some color, way up here in the sky, and then I'm ready to go to. What color should I? I want it to be a little bit more turquoisey than what I've been doing so far. And of course, that's too intense. Bear with me for a minute while I spread that out. <laughs> Georgie is back. What did you miss? Well, you you might have missed a watercolor, a, a color wheel um, explanation. I don't know, but you can watch it later. Uh, this is the third of the sketches that I've done this evening. Um, the first two, the first one was a, a, a gate in New York City. And by the way, I'm kind of happy with that one but no this one is this one is i'm going to do this again because i i can do it better will do it better uh this one will not be for sale don't want that out in public um this one i am quite happy with just a real quick sketch looking up at the uh statue of liberty i am happy with that one and i hope to do a large painting of that okay now i think i'm ready to go to um uh, light stuff let's start with yeah i'll start with white I'll, I'll make make it easy on myself so um i just am putting out some white fresh white gouache coming in now with a round brush and let's start doing some highlights here whoa <laughs> That gouache is too thick. Let me thin it out just a little bit. I need to find a clean spot on my on my palette over here, which is pretty hard to do. There aren't many clean spots left, as you can see. Let's try that again. Okay, so even though you see my hand, the way I'm the way I'm holding the the brush, I really do not want to do. Uh, death control grip. I want to keep this somewhat loose, even though I just did a whole series of tight marks, didn't I? Now... Yeah, here we go. Let's make, I'm going to make a light effect in my painting that does not exist in the photograph. And that is, I'm going to have a shadow coming down across the front, the main body of the building at an angle. Can you see that? It's, it's kind of subtle, but it's just enough to make some interesting play of light going on. As you know, I'm all about play of light. Now let's do the front lawn. It's fairly easy, big, wide stroke of pure
pure white. Now, if this were a oil painting, or in my case, acrylic underneath and oil on top, um, I would not be doing until I, I would not be doing all this pure out of the tube titanium white. Um, all of this snow, and I. By the way, I do plan to do large paintings of all of these sketches. That's part of the reason why I'm doing the sketches, just to help me work out the problems on a small scale before I go big. Um, I would not be, there'd be all kinds of colors in underneath this white. There'd be layers and layers and layers of color, all different color, pastel, pastel-ish colors to be sure, lightish colors under the snow, but colors nonetheless. Orange, brown, blue, turquoise, uh, indigo, uh, violet, all kinds of colors. And then in the f only in the very, very last layer would I come back with opaque white oil paint and do white on top of. My technique, If I'm, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with my painting technique, and one of the things that my technique I feel like does best is white subject matter, like painting things that are actually white. So white houses, uh, a couple years ago, you can find it on my website. Um, I did a painting of a, of a fire truck and it was a live on plein air. It was a on location painting of a fire truck. And uh, the, the hood, the front part of the truck was all white, not red. Like most of you might think that a fire truck is normally, but it was white. And I had so much fun creating the illusion of um, of whiteness. For instance, it was in a, in a, uh, you know, a civic building, or what do you call it? A, a, a hall, a display hall. I'm the, my, my, again, my mind's going blank for the, the right word, but it was in a, in a building where all these trucks were on display. It was a, you know, a place for firemen to buy trucks. <laughs> and, um, there were a lot of little lights up in the ceiling. There were a lot of little lights up in the ceiling and the every like hundreds of them up in the girders of this uh, convention center. That's the word I'm looking for. And um, all these lights cast a brilliant sparkle on the fire truck. So here's a quiz for you. If you're painting a fire truck that is white and the white truck has the reflection of a hundred spark twinkly lights above it, you know, what color do you paint it? Well, the answer sure, certainly is you don't paint it white. That's for sure. It says if you paint it white, at first you have nowhere left to go and you can't do any sparkle on top of white. So if you want to see what I'm talking about, just go to dannelsonart.com and click on paintings. And then inside the paintings page, there are a number of albums. And one of them is uh, automotive art, automotive paintings. And you'll find my fire trucks there. And you'll see this painting that I did of a fire truck in a convention hall, in a convention center. And I was quite happy with the effect, how it turned out. So the, again, I'm talking about how do you paint white on white? And the answer is the first white is not white. Do you get that? But here in this little sketch, I'm, I'm rushing to judgment. <laughs> I'm doing a less refined kind of artwork so I, in fact, did very early on, I did right straight out of the tube, titanium white. Now, I, I hope you're seeing that tree. Again, I'm, I'm having quite a bit of fun rendering this tree, both trees, that one and that one, by painting the negative. I just mixed up a color of blue, opaque blue, and I'm painting around some of the branches that I that I uh, roughed in earlier with a fuzzy, messy brush, a chip brush. Uh, this is what I used to do the branches earlier. And now I'm just coming and cleaning it up a little bit and trying to give the impression that there are 150,000. That's the number that I use all the time. It's not a scientific number. Um, I don't mean it literally, I mean just a big number, 150,000 branches. Want to give the impression that there are 150,000 branches 
on these trees. I should ask a forester sometime if he actually knows how many branches are on a typical tree. <laughs> Somebody want to Google that for me? I'm sure it would, I mean, they'd, they'd, be, they'd say, what kind of tree? What are you talking about? How big is it? What kind of tree? And that, then we get complicated then. Now, I wonder, I think I've got a white pencil here. Oops. I do not. It's, it's been taken somewhere else, so no problem. Um, I'm going to get a, grab a very small brush, which is probably better anyway. How's that? A Lucas Taclon, Rote Taclon, number two. So it's not the smallest brush in the world, that's for sure, but it's fairly small. And let's do some, let's do some do details, especially the mullions in the windows. Now again, I want to be careful not to be too careful. I'm starting a little too slow here. My dad was a good painter. And uh, he passed away about 10 years ago at the age of 86. So we can't complain about how long we had him with us. Um, I remember so <laughs> as I was, when I was a child and when I was a young man and as an art major even and so forth, he did his best to try to convey to me the the importance of loose brush strokes, and I'm I'm afraid I didn't really get it until well yeah during his lifetime. But but I think I was in my mid 30s. You know, so understand, I'd been a professional artist for quite some time with an art degree under my belt and so forth. But I was in my mid 30s, I think, before I had a hand that equaled my dad's. That is, I, I didn't really understand this edges. The new term for what I'm talking about now is called edge control. I, I made a bit of a joke about that um, the last week or so. The new, the new term for painterly style is called edge control. Just in case you want to be in on the latest, greatest terminology, we don't call it brush strokes anymore. We call it edge control. I'm being facetious. But there's a degree of, there's a grain of truth in it. Anyway, my dad was very good at edge control. And sometimes his ghost still s comes and slaps me. <laughs> In a loving way, of course, and tries to say, uh, 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 Dan, watch out there, watch out there. You're getting awfully tight there. You're getting awfully tight. And I go, oh, doggone it, I am. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. I'm, I'm coming in for a landing here, I think. I, that's enough of that tiny brush, I think. I don't think I need any more of that. Let's get back to a normal human-sized brush. A human-sized brush is one where you can see the, you know, the end. <laughs> it doesn't fade down into one hair. <laughs> um, there was something I was going to do with this white. Yeah. It's a dirty white. Not as, not as white as what I've been using. Yeah, let's put, do some of this. Okay, now, actually I need to switch brushes again. need something thinner than this. Maybe not as thin as what I used a minute ago. Because I, I want to do, again, here's my reference. And I do want to do some of this snow on branches. That's part of what makes this scene. Oh, but you know what? I'm sorry, before I do that, I really, really should nail down this uh, light in the window thing. One window with uh, warm light coming out of it really, really sets the painting off. And that's right up here. Now, I may need to do more than one layer of this to cover up this dark that I accidentally put on top of it.
Oh, a little bit of light down to here too, so I'll put light in three windows. Fair enough. Couple dots there. Okay, now I'll come back and lighten, lighten that after it dries. Now I believe it's time for snow on branches. By the way, this would be a wonderful time right now to be painting on aluminum. <laughs> because you can just scratch out the, you just take the butt end of your brush and start scratching. Whoops, whoops. That mark's too big. So let's see what I can do here to give the impression of snow on these branches. I'm going to try to avoid painting one branch at a time, if you know what I mean. Some bigger limbs and some smaller ones. Mm -mm -mm. Not terribly happy with the way that's looking, though. The branches, that is to say. Oh, there we go. That works well. Do that before it dries. Oh, excellent, excellent. Way to go, Dan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Feel free to congratulate yourself anytime you do something right. By the way, most artists do not uh, congratulate themselves enough. Let me give you the formula. This came to me in the middle of the night when the cosmos speaks to me and gives me wisdom. Here it is. You ready? Um, here's the formula for success, for growth. Not, not success, for growth as an artist. The formula for growth is a little bit of discouragement <laughs> uh, mixed with megatons of encouragement. Little bit, not discouragement. What I mean by that is not literal discouragement, but little... You need to learn that you need to learn things. You need to learn that, oh, every time you learn something, there's a little bit of pain associated with it, like, oh, man, I should have known that. That was dumb. You know, a little bit of that, right? So in order to grow, there needs to be a little bit of that pain, just a little bit. But here's the formula. Little bit of pain. Oh, rats, I should have known that. Intermixed with megatons of woohoo, that I did a great job. And I say this because many, many of you have that completely backwards. And I know this is true because I talk to students and I talk to uh, at painters' forums and so on all the time. And beginner artists, they'll, they'll put their painting up on the easel, and before they even do say anything, they'll start going, oh, well, it's not very good, I, I'm, not, I'm not very good, and it's not very good, and I'm just a beginner, and it's not very good, and it's, it's really not very good. Have I, I'm sorry, I'm just mocking the heck out of some of you. I'm hoping I'm knocking you to the point that you'll stop doing that. That is not how you succeed as an artist. It's a little bit of, of correction encouched in megatons of encouragement. Wow, that looks great. That's amazing. Look what I did. I did a good job. Woohoo! Can you believe it? I did a good job. I can't believe I did that. That's that's the inner talk you should have. And yes, you can ask me, do I do that? And the answer is absolutely. What do you think? But I, I have enough discouragement. Don't get me wrong. I have enough. Oh, man, I should have done that. I, I, can, I can do better than that. Okay, right now I'm looking for a sharp implement, and I don't have one because I'm sitting down here at my, uh, so I'm using my pocket knife. <laughs> so I want to do a little scratching right here to indicate mullions in this uh, lit up window. It's working quite well, actually. Um, people ask me all the time, uh, you know, if I'm a perfectionist, am I ever happy with my paintings? And my answer is yes, absolutely, many times. All the time? No, are you kidding? Not all the time. Not all the time. No, no, no. But many times I'm quite happy with my work. And I, again, I, I think that's, you should feel the same way. Many times you should be happy, even if it's conditional happiness, like, well, I'm, I'm nowhere where I want to be, but I'm way better than I used to be. That, okay? Do that until, until you can do better than that. Until you can say, dang, I'm good. <laughs> That's where I want you to, that's where I really want you to get to. And when, when an artist says that, I, I say this all the time, because I say that, you'll, you'll hear me say that when I'm painting. 
When an artist says that, it is not boasting or braggadocio. It is authentic, childlike surprise. Like, whoa, I get, that's wonderful. I can't believe I did that. That's the voice that's speaking when you do something really good. And that voice should be speaking to you quite often. Okay, I hope you'll take that to heart. The path to progress and improvement is little bits of correction, which is always, always hurts a little bit. Little bits of correction interspersed with megatons of attaboy, way to go, that's amazing, I'm doing fantastic. Okay, I almost forgot here, I have a flag to do. And I have, and maybe that's all, just a flag, let's do... Just put that red down then and scratch it a little bit. Uh, that didn't do much, but it's okay. And then some blue. And likewise, that's too dark as well. Let me see if I can blot some of that up. Oh, perfect. Yeah, when I blotted it up, it got better. The same thing with the, the red. There's too much, too much of a good thing, shall we say. So I've just re-wetted it. I'm going to blot it with a tissue... Normally called Kleenex in America, by the way. I don't know what it's called the rest of the world, but it's only when I'm trying to be correct that I call it a tissue. All the rest of my life, it's a... Anybody got a Kleenex? Funny how that happens. In Texas, I lived in Texas for a number of years, all soft drinks are called Cokes, no matter what, what they are. I want a Coke. What kind of Coke do you want? <laughs> orange Coke. I want an Orange Coke. <laughs> I want a Dr. Pepper Coke. At least it was that way when I lived there. I don't know if it's still that way. It was quite fun. Okay, I think I'm done. What do you think? Am I done? Let's do the, let's do the fun reveal. And by the way, if I, dis, if I decide to, I can um, you know, reapply more masking tape and come back into these little sketches and um, work on them some more if I like. But I like to do the, the fun part of revealing it while you guys are still watching. Because it, it's like Christmas, isn't it? It's like, whoa, look at that. It's so little, 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 looks so cool. All right. Huh. Not bad. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, there you go. Try to get that centered for you. I'm working on it. There we go. So, the White House in winter by Dan Nelson. That's me. <laughs> and I think I'm pretty happy with that one. I mean, it's just a little quick sketch, uh, but it helped me make several decisions. I'll make some. I'll make some modifications to that before I go to a big painting. But even having done this helps me a little bit to decide how I want to proceed. Good, Heather. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm. I'm enjoying doing it too. And of course. In the wintertime, when it's really, really cold outside, <laughs> it's actually quite nice to be so lazy. <laughs> Instead of being out there plain air painting like a real man, <laughs> like a real artist, I'm in here being in, in the warmth of my home, <laughs> of my uh, upstairs studio. Um, but I believe that'll do it for today. I got a delightful wife and kids and company downstairs. They're not waiting on me. They're watching a football game. But I like this one. That was kind of fun. Okay, good enough. Thanks for watching. I'll be back uh, tomorrow night, I hope, to broadcast while I'm doing this wedding. Thanks again, and I'll look for your comments later.